United States Army presents The Big Picture, an official report produced for the armed forces and the American people. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. The United States Army is a global army. It stands guard in many lands as the shield of the free world. Some of these lands are very pleasant, the delight of tourists and travelers. Others lie in remote corners of the world, lonely, hazardous, and severe. But in every place, there is a job to be done a job that must be done to keep our defenses strong and to make sure that the free world remains free. Today, the big picture takes you behind the scenes to two widely separated lands and two strikingly different army operations. The first part of our story is called Barriers to the North. This is the Greenland ice cap, a huge mass of ice and snow that runs the length and most of the breadth of the world's largest island. And these are the men of the United States Army Corps of Engineers who are fighting a winning battle against the Arctic enemy. Their mission is to finish two radar warning systems against surprise aerial attack from across the pole. One warning system is the dew line. It is an electronic tripwire stretching from the Aleutians across Alaska, Canada, and Greenland to Iceland. Operated under the joint control of the United States and Canada, it will set off an alarm if an enemy bomber tries to sneak through. When these four stations in Greenland are installed, the last gap in the radar screen will be sealed. Planes at Sandström, Thule, and other Air Force bases will have several hours warning in case of enemy bomber attack. This is one station in the Air Force warning system. The second radar warning system lies 600 miles to the north in the Thule defense area. This is the ballistic missile early warning system known as BMUs. These monster antennas will scan the communist land mass from Poland to the Pacific Ocean and will detect approaching missiles 3,000 miles away. The target date for finishing the dew line and BMUs is the summer of 1960. Only during the summer months are cargo ships able to push their way through the ice packs that encircle Greenland. Ice, frost and snow rule Greenland with dictatorial force. The construction problems that face the Army engineers were almost beyond belief. The ice cap is a mammoth slab, 1,600 miles long and 10,000 feet deep. Every year adds a three-foot layer of snow. The ice cap yields to the surface earth along the coasts of Greenland, but the frost hardens the ground like concrete to a depth of 2,000 feet the year around, aptly earning the name of permafrost. The story of how the Army's Corps of Engineers conquered these mighty forces of nature is a great epic of engineering skill, imagination, and unremitting hard work. The project was carried out jointly by the United States and Denmark, for Greenland is Danish soil. Danish construction companies, using Danish workmen, were awarded contracts to build a dew line station on the west coast of Greenland and an identical one on the east coast, while Americans built the two interior ones on the ice cap. The coastal stations were supplied mainly by sea. Service ships kept up a summer-long flow of supplies. To save time, cargo was unloaded directly into heavy-duty trucks brought to the ship's side by naval landing craft. As soon as these hit the beach, the trucks rolled on their way to the unloading point. At the same time, Army amphibious craft delivered full loads ashore, where mechanical stevedores transferred the cargo to waiting trucks. The first thing to be built was a temporary base camp for the work crews. 
Next came a road on which to haul steel and lumber from the landing beach to the site of the warning station. This distance was only four miles as the crow flies, but detours required by the permafrost brought the final road length to 18 miles. Once the road was completed, workmen set about the construction of pipelines for fuel and water to service the crews building the radar station. Because of the difficulty of digging into the permafrost, the fuel lines, which followed the contours of the road, were installed above ground. The radar station was erected on a commanding headland of rock, 5,000 feet high. The scanning and detection antenna will be housed in a plastic ray dome atop the tower rising from the main building. Lifted high above the surrounding terrain, the antenna will have an unobstructed field for scanning. The two-story steel frame building is a composite structure. It will enclose the technical equipment and power generators, plus living quarters for the operational staff of about 23 men. Communication with other Dewline stations will be held via 30-foot sending and receiving dish antennas, which will bounce signals off the troposphere. This method is practically immune to jamming by the enemy or to interference from natural electrical disturbances. Physical communication between the West Coast Station and Sandestrom Air Base will be maintained the year round by way of helicopter. This will mean regular mail, special medical care if needed, and a steady supply of creature comforts, including hi-fi records. Across Greenland, on the East Coast, an identical station is going up. The weather on this side is much worse because of the stormy reaction of the warm Gulf Stream on the frigid seas. Luckily, only a six-mile road had to be built to reach the site of the composite building. This is on solid rock over 1,000 feet high. For aerial communication with the Sandestrom base, a 4,000-foot airstrip was hacked out of the rock and tundra. Building the two warning stations on the ice cap presented different and sometimes more difficult problems. These were constructed by American crews, and every item of equipment had to be flown in over the ice cap's impassable terrain. All materials had to be designed and fabricated to fit within the hold of the C-130 cargo planes. Even these huge girders for the radar station Eight supporting columns hold the secret of how the 68-ton bulk of the station is sustained above the ice cap. Each column consists of two members laced together. It is braced by a steel framework which rests on a broad timber mattress 31 and a half feet below the surface. All eight columns are connected below ground by trusses encased in timber boxes. The area is then backfilled with compacted snow right up to the original snow line. The composite building will literally be suspended from the columns, which will rise 75 feet above the snow. This will permit the building to be jacked upward as much as 30 feet over a 10 or 12 year period. Jacking will be done by two power operated 350 ton hydraulic jacks at each column, 16 in all. These may be operated separately or together from a central control panel. Since the snow accumulates about three feet per year, jacking up the building the same distance will maintain a clearance of 19 feet above the surface. This clearance will allow the snow-laden winds to pass through under the building rather than pile up snow against its sides. Fuel for power and heat will come from four huge 100,000 gallon tanks sunk beneath the surface. The construction work goes on day and night in 12-hour shifts undeterred by difficulties and discomforts. Even in the so-called summer months, these films were shot in August, 
the temperature rarely goes above freezing. Workmen outdoors must wear heavy gloves and parkas. But these are hardy men. Many are veterans of construction work in the Arctic. They take pride in their jobs and are keenly aware of the importance of their work. Everything possible is done to keep morale and working efficiency high. Food, good food, and lots of it, is all important. Cooks are selected almost as carefully as engineers. Meals are available around the clock. As the 12-hour shifts change, one shift may be eating breakfast while the other is enjoying supper. The men relax in warm and comfortable living quarters. A qualified physician is always on hand. No effort is spared to keep the men in good health. To the east, on the ice cap, construction goes forward on an identical station. About the only difference is that working conditions here are even more severe. This area is located many miles from the storm-plagued east coast. The men find the cold more clammy and snowfalls heavier, but these handicaps only spur them on to keep pace with construction elsewhere. All four new Dewline stations must be completed at the same time, end of summer, 1960. Farther north at Thule, the Army Corps of Engineers labors to meet the same deadline for the ballistic missile early warning system. This station is similar to the one located at Clear, Alaska, and a third to be built in the British Isles. Interlocking, they will form a continuous radar screen against any missile attack from the far north. Each antenna is 400 feet long and 165 feet high, larger than a football field laid on its side. It is designed to withstand 12 inches of ice on its screen, plus winds up to 185 miles per hour. Twenty struts brace each antenna, each embedded in huge concrete footings, founded on a gravel pad. Each strut is 40 inches in diameter, Every item here is king size. All antennas and buildings are connected by a 6,000-foot passageway, which can accommodate motor vehicles. Prefabricated, insulated panels guard against the cold. To protect against the hazard of radiation from the high-frequency antennas, Copper screens insulate the floor and are welded to the metal wall panels. Power for the antennas will come from a floating U.S. Navy power plant with three big generators. The ship is permanently moored in a slip designed to protect it from the crushing ice. To guard the BMU's installation and the entire Thule defense area against aerial assault, the Army Corps of Engineers carried through Project Rising Star. This is an underground installation emplacing four batteries of the supersonic, deadly accurate Nike Hercules missiles. To make room for the elevator pits, the stubborn permafrost had to be drilled and blasted to a depth of 30 feet. Fantastic weapons. Fantastic equipment, fantastic skill and stamina, all involving a combined effort by the U.S. Army and her sister services to keep America invulnerable from surprise attack from the North. It is a far cry and a long journey from the icy wastes of Greenland to the lush Rhine River Valley, and a dramatic contrast from the feat of engineering you have just seen to the Army's job at Mannheim, a seaport in Germany 350 miles from the sea. The second story is called Journey to Mannheim.
Behind the American ground forces in Germany that stand as a free world deterrent against aggression from the east is a vast supply network extending back to America. A little known but important link in this supply network is the United States Army installation at the old German city of Mannheim on the famous Rhine River. It is called the Mannheim subport of the Army's port of embarkation at Bremerhaven. It is a discharge berth and transfer point for military cargo moving through river terminals on the upper Rhine and its tributaries. Ludwigshaven on the west bank of the Rhine is another and so is Frankfurt to the northeast on the river Main, which flows into the Rhine at Mainz. Most of this cargo originates at the subport of Rotterdam in the Netherlands, where it is delivered by ship from America and transferred to Rhine River barges. Loading and unloading of military cargo at Mannheim and other subports is done by civilian help supplied by German firms under the supervision of United States Army personnel. This is Sergeant Russo, a highly experienced transportation agent. Like other soldiers stationed here, Russo takes pride in the subport's ability to move vast amounts of cargo quickly and cheaply. Although over 350 miles from deep water, Mannheim has all the equipment of a normal seaport, including 30-ton and 100-ton heavy lift cranes. It handles all kinds of cargo, from trucks and tanks to missile parts and household goods. Russo is about to realize a long-held wish. A friend from the barge company has been urging him to make the river trip, starting in Rotterdam, where the cargo is loaded, then sailing south along the picturesque Rhine to Mannheim. Russo tells his friend that he is ready, finally, to take this busman's holiday. He has the necessary leave time. Official permission has been granted. He is leaving that night for Rotterdam, where he will board a barge making the return trip. This is Sergeant Russo's first visit to the Dutch seaport of Rotterdam. Many of the old buildings were razed by German bombing in 1940. Most of those destroyed have now been replaced by highly modern structures, the Lynn Bonn Shopping Center, the railroad post office building, the central railroad station, and the Rhine Hotel, where Sergeant Russo stays overnight. No traveler can visit Rotterdam today without looking at the statue commemorating Dutch resistance to Nazi occupation. Sergeant Russo, too, pays his respects to these striking figures and the courage and patriotism they represent. Rotterdam opens to the North Sea. It is Holland's largest port and can accommodate all ocean-going vessels. The USNS Croton, at first glance, seems to be an aircraft carrier. Actually, it is a special type of supply ship. Its berthing is a smooth, seasoned procedure that reflects the experience of many such dockings. is its striking cargo unusual anymore. These helicopters are destined for army units in Germany. They comprise one of many such overwater shipments. Sergeant Russo and an official of the Rotterdam subport observe the transfer from supply ship to barge. It is obvious from the smooth handling of the copters that the transfer is routine to the loading crew.
As soon as the last helicopter is secured on the barge, its captain comes looking for his passenger. He has a tight schedule. The barge must be on its way to Mannheim. A water trip across Rotterdam Harbor is bound to be colorful. Even in this busy concourse of steel ships and bustling barges, one can always find the flash of a white sail to remind the voyager of how man first started out to conquer this mighty element. A sailboat is romantic, but the sight of an ocean liner like the new Rotterdam is awe-inspiring. Every era adds its landmarks to an ancient city. The turret on that tower houses a brand new restaurant. Next, a monument to the merchant seamen who lost their lives in the Second World War. The waterways teem with new shipping, like this brand new coaster built in Rotterdam. Those shipyards spawn river barges by the dozen. A hospital ship. We have sailed south from the Lech River to the Rhine. Lobith is on the east bank, the last Dutch town before we reach the German border. This is flat tidewater country the barge is passing through, almost idyllic in its scenes of neat, snug houses and browsing cattle. Sergeant Russo, although a passenger, insists on helping the crew with its chores. He lends a hand to check the lines that secure the helicopters. Rhine River currents are strong and erratic. Even a flat-bottomed barge can be buffeted about. We are in German waters now, and the first town we see is the bustling industrial community of Emmerich. The first view of Köln is a modernistic shoreline restaurant. Köln, known outside Germany as Cologne, is the metropolis of the Rhineland. Founded by Rome in the time of Christ, it was always a great center of culture and religion, as well as industry and trade. Its world-famous open spire cathedral is considered a masterpiece of Gothic architecture. It allegedly contains relics of the three wise men of the East. The river is heavy with traffic. Over 16,000 boats ply the Rhine. Tough little paddle wheelers still churn through the waters, a reminder of another great river thousands of miles away, the Mississippi. First view of Bonn, capital of West Germany. This ancient cultural center, famous for its university, is the seat of government of the German Federal Republic. Huge new government buildings completely screen the old city from view. The barge continues southward to Remagen and the Remagen Bridge, a name that will always stir memories for veterans of World War II. This is where American troops seized the only bridge across the Rhine and swept on to the conquest of Germany. The old bridge is gone now, collapsed. Only the piers remain, but a new one is rising to take its place. The barge captain informs Sergeant Russo they are now passing through the most picturesque section of the Rhine, the famous Dragonfelt. The river flows through a gorge world-renowned for its landscapes, its castle ruins, and legendary landmarks. There is the old Roman fortress called Aaron Breistein, as awesome today as it was in ancient times. Across from it, on the west bank, is the Deutsches Ecke, where the Mosella River, originating in France, flows into the Rhine. This is Germany's vineyard center, the home of the famous Rhine wines. The river twists in an S-curve here, and around one of its turns appears the ancient town named after St. Gore, who is buried here. Behind it, the vast remains of Rheinfels, on the east bank, Burgkatz, built in 1393. And now, perhaps the most famous landmark of all, the Cliff of the Lorelei. 
According to legend, this is where an enchantress sang a song which lured sailors to destruction on these rocks, known as the Seven Maidens. Another turn of the Rhine. The barge is in sight of Oberwesel, with its waterfront tower and its church shaped long and narrow in the outline of a ship. Directly north of it is Schoenberg, largest castle on the Rhine. The town of Kaub with its terraced vineyards. In front of it, the island castle of Deep Falls. Ancient Bacharach with its 16 stone watchtowers and its living watchers on the riverbank. The ruins of Furstenberg Castle, whose owner barons imposed tolls on river travelers. We are deep in the gorge of the Rhine River Valley. Another turn, and there is beautiful Lork, nestling peacefully at the foot of cultivated vineyards. And still more castles, Reichenstein, gloomy Schloss Rheinstein, Ehrenfels, whose twin towers guard the lush vineyards below, all celebrated in song and story. We are approaching the end of the journey. Everything on the barge must be made ship -shape. As soon as the barge arrives at Mannheim, the helicopters are lifted off. They are immediately rolled away. There is no lingering here. They will be sent directly to their military destination. Sergeant Russo looks at the cargo with a new point of view, that of the Rhine River sailor. He leaves the barge and its crew with increased respect for them. He also has renewed pride in his job, the job of all at Mannheim Subport, to keep vital supplies moving to the troops who man our first line of defense on the frontiers of the free world. The big picture is an official report for the armed forces and the American people. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center. Presented by the Department of the Army in cooperation with this station.